Entertainment or invitation? Why stream sung worship? What's your goal? G'day, my name's Grant Norsworthy. I'm the founder and principal instructor for More Than Music Mentor. I provide online and on-site training for the heart and the art of worshipping musicians. In this video, we're going to be talking about streaming, especially the broadcasting of the audio and video of church services. Um, you know, typically, the ch Christian church gathers on Sunday morning, but other times as well. And what's become really popular is for churches to stream their services, record the service, including the sung worship, and make that available to people over the internet. Typically, this is a live stream on YouTube or on Facebook and putting it out to the world. And in many cases, these, uh, these recordings remain available online indefinitely. And we're talking about the whole service. There's preaching, there's uh, Bible reading, there might be announcements, but also there's this sung worship or the musical component of the church service. Now, the purpose of my video today is to really invite you to ask yourself some big, tough questions about your streaming. And I want to speak to you a little bit about this idea of why versus what and how. You know, when we're presented with a problem like streaming a church service, making a suitable audio and video recording of a church service, and streaming that out onto the internet, people tend to jump straight away to the what and the how. How do we solve these what and how problems? But I'm going to ask you to, before you try to answer your what and how, ask yourself the big why question. Why stream? You need to know the goal that you're shooting for before you answer your what and your how. This requires some intentionality. We've got to be very intentional. Otherwise, we can make big mistakes with the what and the how. We can waste resources and end up, end up not achieving the goal at all. Some background. You know, the Christian church has been around for over 2,000 years now. People of the Christian faith, followers of Jesus, have gathered together to worship for all that time. And music and singing has always been a part of that. But the world has changed a lot over the last couple of thousand years. And in fact, I would suggest that the changes we've seen in the last 50 years, changes with the internet and digital media and social, uh, social platforms, these are some of the biggest changes that the church has ever had to encounter in the last 500 years. And as you will recall, I'm sure, it was around the year 2020, either side of that a little, depending on where you were living, where COVID-19 restrictions really had a huge impact on the Christian church and especially our physical gatherings. Now, even before 2020 and COVID-19, some of the bigger Christian churches, churches we might call mega churches, were already making video recordings of their services. And some of them were streaming those services, streaming them live. Uh, but with COVID-19 and those restrictions that were placed on gatherings, Almost every church in the developed world wanted to start streaming their services. There was a desperate scramble to get streaming. And at that time, pretty much any quality was good enough, no matter what size the church. Even smaller churches were trying to stream so that people, even though they couldn't gather in the one room together, could still stay connected, could still hear the sermon and uh, be part of some sort of online church services. Uh, now that we are free uh, to gather again, uh, COVID-19 seems to uh, have passed us by. Many churches are still streaming. Why? We can gather in the room together. There must be some really good reasons to continue because it's become almost ubiquitous that Christian churches want to stream their services, want to video record them and make them available, broadcast them widely online. Uh, even tiny little home churches in some cases are wanting to stream their services. You know, it's post-COVID and uh, I think a lot of us are looking at the quality of our stream and wanting to improve it, wanting to make it better because what was okay during COVID-19, during that desperate scramble, may not be the quality we're looking for now. Uh, maybe that's why you're watching this video right now. But let's be clear about something before I continue. I'm not a technician and I'm certainly not a salesman. Uh, I'm a musician 
Uh, I'm not going to be on this video telling you what gear to buy so that you, you can take your stream quality to the next level. Um, I'm not going to be doing that. See, More Than Music Mentor provides training online and on-site for the heart and the art of worshipping musicians and technicians. Music is my special interest and in how music and tech work together. You know, the promise I make to people who uh, have me do some training is that I can improve musicality, increase participation, instill unity and inspire worship. I'm most interested in what's actually happening in the room before the internet and before a camera lens, what's happening in the room before the audio leaves the mixing console and heads towards your stream. Well, I'm interested in that, but I will be sharing ways to improve your stream but I'm going to be talking mainly about improving the source material. What are we actually seeing in the room that the camera is picking up? What are we hearing in the room that the microphones are picking up and are making their way to the stream? You know, I think it's important too that before we jump too deeply into all that about how to improve the stream, we, we look at what I call the lesser goal and the bigger goal. You know, you might be watching this video right now because you've got this goal of wanting to have a better stream of your church service, or maybe you wanted to start a stream of your church service. In either case, I'd like you to think of that goal, the goal of having a streamed church service as a lesser goal. There's an essential bigger goal that needs to be identified first. And I think we need to look for this bigger goal question to be answered from the very top of the authority in our church. What is your church's overall vision? What are the goals for your particular church? First, we need to ask, why does your church exist? You can insert the name of your church there. Why does, say the name of your church, exist? Define your goals. What are your values? And when I say these, uh, these questions need to be answered from the top down, I'm talking about going as high as God. We need to look at what the Bible tells us are the goals of the Christian church. Do you know what they are? Because before we answer the questions of the stream, we need to ask, ask these and answer them. Now, a lot of Christian churches, and I, and I hope you would agree with this, we have these goals of loving God, loving others, and making disciples. Now, you might have some slightly different wording wrapped around it, but I'm hoping that is why your church exists. These goals are actually taken from the very words of Jesus. In fact, we can look in uh, Mark chapter 12, where Jesus gives us what many people call the greatest commandment, which is to love God and love others. And then we see in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus talks about the great commission, which is go and make disciples. This is why a lot of churches would agree with this. We've got to love God, love others, and make disciples. I think this needs to come from your senior pastors or your elders. Maybe this is a denominational thing that needs to be passed down because you don't want decisions being made about the stream that don't reflect this greater goal, this bigger goal. So how to stream, uh, what gear should we buy? These are lesser questions that need to be answered later. We must not allow streaming or anything else to tear us away from that bigger goal. So let's take a big distant look, I guess, at the Christian church in the developed world and uh, speak about that in regard to streaming. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of facts and figures that come from the Barna Group. Uh, they're a really well-respected group in the United States who do all sorts of research, including research and statistics about the Christian church. And they published a study in 2016 called State of Church. Now, 2016 is a few years ago. I, I grant you that. Uh, and it's these are American statistics as well. This is pre-COVID. But I think these numbers are still worth us keeping in mind because I'm not sure they will have shifted too much. In the, in the intervening years. But that study, State of Church from Barna, told us that only 8% of Americans who regularly attend church services are part of a congregation of 1,000 or more people. But 46% of people attend a church service where the congregation is 100 or less. A hugely uh, higher proportion of people who attend church services attend small church services. Interestingly, 40%, Barna tells us, attend a church of between about 100 and 350. 
Now, I was born in Australia, lived most of my life there, lived in America for 17 years, but now I'm living in New Zealand. That's where I'm making this video from. And New Zealand's a very small country with a very small church. I think countries like New Zealand, maybe even Australia, those figures, maybe even the percentage of people who are attending smaller churches is even higher. No, it's those mega churches or those very big churches of over a, over a thousand people. They're the ones that are streaming. They're the ones that maybe were streaming before COVID and they do it and they do it well, but they are representing a very small percentage of the church. It's just worthwhile keeping that in mind. And so let's talk about how these bigger churches, mega churches and very big churches, churches of over a thousand go about their streaming. Well, let's understand that these churches are highly visible and highly influential uh, and they commit huge resources to their streaming. In fact, their influence in the, the media marketplace is perhaps disproportionate to the num number of people that they represent. Uh, we don't have to be streaming and presenting a church service that looks like theirs. They often have celebrity level, charismatic leaders, preachers, professional level musicians, often who are paid. They have production equipment, hardware that's just out of this world in many cases. Professional audio engineers, video engineers, lighting technicians operating all that side of it. And often these churches are not just churches. They're also record labels. They're also production companies and doing high levels of production in their venue each Sunday or anytime they have a service is what they do. They're very good at it. Uh, did you know that they often have a separate broadcast studio in order to stream? No, there's, there's engineers who are in the room uh, during the church service, but very separate from that in a different location, probably in the same building, there is a broadcast studio. Uh, there's often post-production. So after the service, sometimes the audio recording and the video recording, it's, it's worked with, it's edited, it's adjusted before it's made available uh, over the internet. Um, a lot of these churches, they're not just streaming their services out to YouTube. No, they're actually producing Christian TV channel content. Now, smaller and medium-sized churches often look at what's streamed by these mega churches, these bigger churches, and thinks, well, that's what we're supposed to do. But I'd like to say to you really clearly, if you are part of a smaller church, even a medium-sized church, please don't try and compete. Uh, most likely you can't anyway, but I don't think it's even our role to compete against that. Now, I have to believe, and I hope you do too, that these extra big churches, these large and even mega churches, they share the same sort of goals that we do in medium-sized and smaller churches. They exist to love God, to love others, and make disciples. These are their values. But they have decided that streaming and streaming at the quality that they are helps them fulfill that goal, helps them fulfill that value. It's a path that they have chosen. Um, they are committed to making what I'm going to call entertaining video content. It looks great. It sounds great. It's high level of production. It's pro quality. And they spent big bucks to get it and worked really hard to do it. Now, I'm not being critical here of those bigger churches. I love them. I've been part of them. I've experienced what they do. And uh, entertainment is not a, a dirty word to me. You know, for them in their context, I celebrate what they're doing that high level of production. Someone can sit down in front of the, a video recording of their church service, even if they don't follow Jesus, even if they're not connected to a church anyway, anywhere, they can find what they're seeing and hearing entertaining, engaging. They can stay sitting there and watching it. And I'm sure those larger churches hope that people are hearing a presentation of the gospel that we believe and we hope is transformative in some way. Now, they can reach people with the gospel in ways that maybe you and I in smaller or medium-sized churches just cannot, and that's okay. So then now let's look at small and medium church streaming. Keeping in mind, I don't believe we need to be competing with those bigger churches. And when I say smaller, I know it's all relative. Different people live in different places, but I, I guess I'm meaning churches of, of less than 1,000 or maybe 500, depending on where you are. Our context is different from those very large and mega churches. You know, it seems to me that if we are a smaller church, a medium-sized church, 
We should be thinking very differently about who we are trying to serve with our stream. Our reality is very different. I don't think we need to be trying to put out something over the internet available to the whole world that is intended to be entertaining for anyone who finds our stream and starts watching it. Now, to me, there are two main groups of people that we should have in mind that we are serving with our stream. And there's actually one group of people that I don't think we should be trying to serve with our stream. Who's this first group? Well, to me, the first group of people who are people who are already part of our church congregation. They're part of our community. Maybe they've been involved for a short time or a long time, but for some reason, one reason or another, they're unable to physically attend our church services, which are typically on a Sunday morning. What are their reasons? They're unwell right now. They're, they need to stay at home or maybe they've got a relative some, or someone that they need to be with 24 hours a day. Um, maybe they work on Sunday mornings. Maybe they work every Sunday morning. They're part of the small group on Tuesday, but they can't be there at the services. Maybe there are some people who are traveling or maybe people who spend months in a different part of the world or a different part of the country during those colder, colder seasons. For whatever reason, there are this, there's this group of people who want to stay connected with us, but they can't physically be in the room with us. There's a group of people we need to be serving. But there's a second group of people that I think we need to be serving with our stream. And I actually think this second group is the main reason why a lot of churches, even of smaller sizes, want to keep streaming. These are the people who actually live within a geographical location that makes them within range of our church building where we meet. They could be there, but they are not currently affiliated with a particular church, and we would like them to call our church home. Yes, they, they live in our local area. Now, they might be seekers, people who are interested to find out more about Jesus, what it means to live life as a Christ follower. Uh, maybe they're looking for their first church family. But more than likely, people in this second group, they, they have moved to your area probably pretty recently, from somewhere else. They can't stay connected with their, their previous church because they've moved too far away. And some of these second group people might be people who, for one reason or another, do not want to keep attending another church. For some reason, they feel like they need to leave. So these people who are unaffiliated with any local church, yet yet they are living in our local area. These are people that I think, yes, we should be serving them as well as the people who just can't physically make it into our church building. Now, these people who are unaffiliated with any particular church, uh, they want to see churches having a stream video so they can check it out. They want to get a feel for it from the stream video and decide whether they want to attend in person or not. Which brings me to the third group of people that I think we shouldn't really be focusing on. We shouldn't really be trying to serve with our stream video, especially when we're a small or a medium-sized church. Now, these are people who might be watching your stream but have no intention of becoming part of your church family, part of your church community. Now, all things are possible with God, of course. Maybe something of the truth of the gospel will flow through the stream and connect with them. But this third group of people who are just watchers but not attenders, if they're watching a small, medium church-sized stream, they'll want it to be entertaining perhaps as entertaining as the megachurch's stream. But like we've said, we're not capable of that. I would suggest don't have that third group of people in mind at all. Let them watch the megachurch's stream. There's quite a few different ones for them to choose from. So let's think about this first group in a little bit more detail. These are the people who are part of your church, but they're unable to attend in person uh, for a short time or maybe for a longer time. Yes, the stream can help them stay connected. Um, but I'm hoping they already have strong relationships with other church members. If they're unwell, staying away for some reason, I hope, I'm hoping they're getting visitors or a phone call, a text. Maybe they're getting a meal delivered. Someone's saying, let's hang out for coffee. If someone's travelling, I hope they're being communicated with in some way or at least they'll be warmly welcomed back when they finish their travels. Now, these people, the first group of people, those who are unable to attend, you will find that they are very, very forgiving of low production for our stream video. They, they want authenticity. They want to just be reminded of what it's like to be in the room with their church family. Can they kind of see and hear everything that's happening? 
good. If that's happening, then we've checked that box. They are being served. For them, the streaming technology can be very basic and very simple. Now, this might just be my opinion, but I think especially smaller churches, the best and easiest way you can stream for this first group of people is just to set up a phone, put it on a clamp, on a mic stand, frame it really well, position it well, and just use the camera from the phone and even the mic from the phone to record what's happening in the room. Use that to stream. Make that available to those people who are unable to attend your service. You can even stream it straight from the phone. And hey, if you don't want the stream seen more widely than just those people, then share it privately. Just put it on uh, YouTube Unlisted or maybe as part of a closed Facebook group. We don't need to broadcast it. Make it available to the whole world. Now let's talk about that second group a little, with a little bit more intentionality. This is, uh, this is the group of people who are unaffiliated with any local church right now and they are potentially looking to become part of your church. So the stream video that we let them see that serves them best is one that is a, a very warm invitation. It should not be, first and foremost, entertainment. Do we really imagine this person is grabbing their phone on a Sunday morning? You know, they're probably still in their pyjamas. They might be sitting on their couch. They might be eating their breakfast or doing other things as, as the stream is on. Do we really think they're fully engaged? Do we imagine that we're, we're seeing them and hearing them singing with our team in the, in the venue? Are they worshipping God through these songs? I don't think they are. They're checking out the stream to see if they want to be there in person maybe next Sunday. They may not even be watching live. They might sit there on a Tuesday evening and watch 10 minutes of five different churches streamed videos. No, our stream, your stream, should make people feel as they watch it. I wish I could have been there. I missed something worthwhile. You know, we don't want people watching our stream thinking, wow, this is as good as actually being there. No, we want to actually communicate the opposite. I believe that people are looking for authentic connection. They want connection with other people, a church family, and they want deeper, authentic connection with God. You know, I think our stream video should honestly show who we are and how we get along with each other and how we connect with God. Show the people that we are connecting with each other and with God. And hopefully they'll see that in our stream video and want to be there next Sunday and maybe become part of our church family. But how do we do that? Well, before we dig into ways of making your smaller, medium-sized church uh, stream even more inviting rather than entertaining, I want to speak about a few of the other ways you can invite that second group of people to be really seriously considering becoming part of your church. You know, traditionally, and when I say traditionally, I guess I mean 50 or 60 years ago and before that, the best way of inviting people who were considering maybe making your church their home was a well-maintained, attractive building in a good location. You know, we wanted to make sure that the lawns were properly manicured and the garden beds were looking healthy. Uh, Well-placed signage right close to the main thoroughfare, hopefully with some very uh, interesting or maybe even funny, informative writing on that sign. These things were the way to go in the past. Um, and I still think those things have merit. They are valid. You know, these old school ways can still be effective. But we are now living in the digital age. Now, you might be thinking, we've got to stream, we've got to stream to invite those second group of people. But I would suggest that there are other ways you can be operating in the here and the now, in the digital age, that also invite, that are not a stream video. Do you have a functional, attractive, informative, up-to-date website? Is there a Facebook page for your church? Are you on Instagram? There are other platforms as well, but are these well-maintained? Are they, are they experiencing a steady flow of, of engaging, informative, well-presented posts? Is there that steady stream of information that helps people know a bit more about who you are and, and how you love God and how you love each other and how you're making disciples? And I think perhaps one of the most overlooked resources is a, is a well-shot, well-edited, polished welcome video. 
two minutes, four minutes long. It could have a short testimony from one of your senior, senior leaders, the senior pastor especially. It might have people just quickly saying what it means to them to be part of your church. F from those testimonials, we should get an idea of the, the wonderful range of ages and ethnicities and, and types and flavours of people that make up our wonderful licorice all sorts of a church. We might even have a little bit of a chat with the, with the Sunday school teacher or the person who leads sung worship. Show some video of the people engaging with each other and engaging with God. A welcome video. Have you got one? Maybe think about that even before you invest more in your stream. And what about just good old church members actively building relationships with people outside the church? and inviting them to come to the service. You know, nothing beats authentic human connection. You know, streaming a church service can be great, but there is one particular big problem that I see with streaming a church service. You know, it's your decision if you stream or not and how much resources you sink into streaming. You know your community. I don't. But I want you to be aware of something, this big problem. And to, to realise what that is, I think we need to look back at what Jesus asked the church to be. He asked us to be a community of people who love God, love people, and make disciples. And you'll notice that each of these goals that Jesus puts before the church starts with a verb, a doing word, love, love, make Verbs cannot be done by passive spectators. And streaming can feed the consumer mentality. Just sitting in front of a screen and watching a sermon, watching a Bible reading, watching people worship God through songs on our behalf can cultivate spectators rather than participants. Yeah, the church does not need viewers. We need doers. You know, I think it's an easy slide. You can have a person who's a regular attender of your church services, and I know it's not all about bums on seats for the church service, It's a, but the church service itself, there's things that are possible in the room that aren't possible in any other way. Yes, there are other ways that we engage with each other, hopefully throughout the week but it is very easy for someone to slip from regular attendance to your services to attending sometimes and viewing a couple when they can't make it, to only viewing, to then maybe viewing our stream and somebody else's from time to time until very easily slipping to become a former churchgoer who watches a streamed video from time to time. You know, a person who participates in our Sunday gatherings, and I'm going to say a, a person who's especially the person who participates in the sung worship of God, this is my bias for the music, I think that person who is more likely to have deep connections with God and deep connections with their church family, horizontal and vertical connections. And I think that person is more likely to participate in other areas of ministry. I think they're more likely to give to the offering plate, to support the food bank, to be part of international mission support, uh, to volunteer to teach at the Sunday school. How can we communicate this participation and involvement in our stream? So you've decided to stream. Well done. Uh, and it is true that live streaming is getting more affordable and easier. Absolutely. That is the case. As time passes, the technology is getting easier to use and less expensive. But it still does cost, and it does take tech ability to make it work. You know, there is a law of diminishing return that applies to this idea of streaming a church service. Very affordably and without a lot of technical ability, you can stream to a pretty decent level. As I've mentioned before, maybe it just takes a, a, a good smartphone. But if you want to improve the quality, it takes more expense, and that curve flattens out pretty fast. The, that extra couple of percentage of improved quality is going to cost a lot more. You'll need dedicated, skilled, available personnel, and you'll need to be ready to invest resources, including dollars. So how do we get the 
biggest improvements? How do we get the biggest bang for our buck and biggest bang for our effort? I don't think it's by buying the latest, greatest camera or lens or microphones or mixing console. I don't think it's from hiring production professionals, audio technicians, lighting technicians, videographers. No, my belief is that we can make the biggest improvement by improving the quality and the suitability of the source material. What is actually happening in the room? What does it look like? And what is the sound that we are making? So a little caveat before I jump into these things that I think are going to improve your stream. Uh, I need to remind you that I'm not a technician and I'm not a salesman, but I feel like I do know quite a bit about connection and how music facilitates connection and how music and technology must work together to maximise the invitation that music and our church service can offer. Comparing a streamed church service, watching a church service on a, vi on a video screen of some sort compared to being in there in the room, it seems to me that the sermon and other elements of our service, like maybe the Bible reading or the announcements, those things are pretty much as good on the stream as compared to being in the room but not the music. No way. Watching a, a screen for sung worship of a church family, that is nowhere near as good as being in the room. The full experience only comes if you are actually there in the room with us. Sure, this is my bias, but music as part of our church service, music that is an expression of the worth of Almighty God, especially vibrant congregational singing, your church family singing passionate praises to God, prayers to God, reminders of truth about God. Now, if you can capture that on your stream, I think it's our opportunity to, to say to anyone viewing, if you'd been in this room with us, you would have experienced something incredible, something wonderful, something transformative, and you missed out because you decided to just watch the stream and not actually be here. And if we can communicate that, people want to be there next Sunday. So how do we improve the video source material? You know, I think the mistake that I see happening over and over again when I watch streamed videos of church services, and I watch a lot of them, I, I have to watch them as part of my job, these smaller churches make the mistake of, I think, trying as best they can to copy the style of the mega church. It's a trap. They're trying to make concert-like entertainment and failing. You know, the video, the shot video exclusively shows the platform, who's speaking, who's singing, who's playing an instrument. Even multi-cameras will show singers, band members, and speakers only. Light bathes the platform the congregation, like a concert audience, is often in darkness. But the invitation to be coming through our video rather than an, a poor attempt at entertainment, I would suggest a very different approach. Yes, the video needs to show who is speaking at any given time, sermon, announcements, Bible reading. Uh, we need to see whatever they're showing to support what they're saying that's on the screens, whether that be images or text. I think it's also very important that we see the leader of sung worship and their supporting team, the, the instrumentalists. We, we would like to see the lyrics of the song, and that's very possible to, to do that. And these are important things to see. But the view that invites more than anything else, the camera shot that I believe, and I hope you agree, will invite more than anything else, is your church congregation passionately worshipping God through songs. Light them well. Shoot from behind the band towards the congregation. Shoot from the back of the room over the top of people's heads. Elevate the camera. Let us see the architecture, the room. Let us get a feel for what's really going on in this place. Now, you might be a vibrant, young, good-looking bunch of very enthusiastic Pentecostals, but maybe not. Whoever you are, be who you are. What we need to see people who believe what they're singing who are passionate about what they're singing. They don't have to be leaping around or even raising their hands. Be who you are. If your people raise their hands, wonderful, well and good. That's great to capture on your stream. If they don't, that's also fine, but they are there and they are singing. 
Now, just a little quick thought here. If we're going to shoot our congregation more, the congregation will need to know that. You know, when people attend sporting events or musical concerts that have cameras, I believe, I'm told at least, I haven't seen it myself, but there's some little line of text somewhere on the website or even on the ticket that says, hey, you might show up on a video feed and you have to be okay with that. We need our church family to know that too. In fact, we might even say, hey, look, this is what we're doing. We're trying to invite people to become part of our church. We want to have people who are vibrant and passionately worshipping God through these songs. Um, if you don't want to be seen by our video cameras that are going to be capturing that, then here's a little area. Set aside some seats for those who perhaps don't want to be in the video. And how about the audio? How do we improve the audio source material? Well, I'm going to ask some tough questions here. In your church, what's the standard of the musicians like and the singers? You know, you've got people that we commonly call a worship team. Are they, are they really good singers, really good instrumentalists? What about the technicians? Are they pro level? Well, if you're anything like most churches, unfortunately, our teams often fall way short of ideal for a live stream. You know, often we're, we're under rehearsed. We might be short on talent in a few areas. Uh, but I don't want you to think, oh, if only we had better singers, better musicians, better technicians, then our stream would be better. I'm not saying that. But, and know this, even those very big and mega churches who stream and sound amazing, they're not doing it without a lot of tricks, without a lot of production, and in many cases, post-production. How are us smaller and medium-sized churches supposed to stack up? We can't. Don't try. Now, streamed sound in its simplest form is usually done like this. Someone plugs into the mixing console, just a, just a stereo out, and that is the sound that goes to the stream, just the sound from the desk. What's coming into the desk is every microphone and, and uh, direct insert box, DI box from the platform. That's what we get. Now, that might be okay for the spoken word, for the sermon, for the Bible reading, for the announcement, but it's not going to work for a band. It will never work, and it will never craft a sound for the stream that invites the viewer. I think it's very common that someone mixes the sound, an audio engineer mixes sound, the sound in the room during the church service, and it sounds really good. It sounds vibrant. It sounds real. And it, but then we listen after the fact to the sound on the stream, and it's shocking how different it is. It can be demoralizing. No, the sound of a room is very, very forgiving. The, the, the walls and the windows and the surfaces and especially the sound of the congregation and the energy of being in the room help us forgive what's actually in the mix. But we scoop all those things away and leave just what's going through the desk. It'll sound terrible. It's never good. Now, some of these digital desks have multiple layers. You can have a mix that's for the room and another mix for the stream. And I often see sound engineers with their headphones on, with their hands over their headphones, so almost doing the, the hear no evil monkey look, trying to mix the sound for the stream in the room. Again, I would say that is almost impossible, even for a professional, and it's impossible for an amateur. Now, you might be able to resource and have a another console in another location, you're getting a better chance there to get it right. But even then, it can be extremely, uh, extremely difficult to get a sound that's really going to invite a listener who's watching the stream. No, there's something that happens in the room that really sets our music alive and brings about that connection. Now, what we can do is add some ambient mics. Uh, we need to have some microphones, probably, uh, you know, condenser mics or small diaphragm condenser mics pointing at the congregation. We want to have the sound of the room and we especially want to have the sound of the voice of the congregation. We need to hear the people singing as an expression of worship to God. The sound of the congregation singing these songs that are prayers to God and 
praises of God and reminders of truth about God, that is the sound that invites a viewer to want to be part of that choir. It will not be your band on its own. Yes, we want to hear the band, but that band sound should be supporting the voice of the congregation. This is all important. That must be leaned on heavily for the stream, the sound of the room. It'll mask uh, uh, all manner of errors in our, in our audio from our singers and instrumentalists. It'll help disguise it. Now, we're not trying to hide, but we're trying to create a much more realistic uh, sound of what actually was happening in the room. So our front of house mix must support the voice of the congregation. The mix that goes to the stream from the digital channels on the desk must support the voice of the congregation. This is all important to get that sound out there that really invites. Now, you might be hearing me say all this and you might be getting pretty worried. You might be saying to yourself, well, yeah, Grant, but, uh, but our congregation doesn't sing like that. Um, our room doesn't look that good. Uh, we've got quite a few bored faces. There's not many people who are really singing. Yeah, I see that a lot. I hear that a lot. You are not alone. This is the case for many churches today. Uh, it hasn't always been the case, but I believe that Christian churches, by and large, are singing less today than we ever have. You know, there's issues at play here that are not fixed by improving just the stream. Uh, now, there are exceptions. There are some churches who are singing wonderfully well. Uh, but uh, the level of engagement in sung worship in most churches that I've seen is low, especially from men. Uh, this is a concerning situation, and it's actually part of what's inspired me to do more than music mentor. You see, from my perspective, I believe strongly that there's a, there's a confusion in the Christian church today about what it really means to worship God and what is the role of music as one of the expressions of worship. I think singers, people that we call worship leaders, are confused about this. Instrumentalists, technicians, congregations, and even pastors and leaders are confused about what it means to worship God and what is the role of music in our gatherings to worship God. You know, I think there's a bit of a entertainment versus invitation going on with how we're leading sung worship as well. So I've been speaking about wanting to improve the source material. Well, the biggest improvement you can make to your source material is to get your congregation singing, passionately singing, singing in a way that shows on their faces at least and maybe with more of their body as well. Uh, there are huge visual and audio benefits for your stream, but there are also benefits for the whole church. Uh, passionate sung worship is an indicator of a healthy church. Now, there's no quick and easy solutions to this, but with More Than Music Mentor, I've identified what I believe are the main problem areas and built a curriculum that meets those problem areas and affirms and encourages people to make some changes that can improve this source material and help our congregation sing as a, as a passionate expression of worship to God. Uh, the curriculum I've developed, I believe, is suitable for Christian churches of all flavors, styles, ages, ethnicities, denominations, and theological emphases. As I've said before, what I promise with More Than Music Mentor is that the teaching I offer can improve musicality, increase participation, instill unity, and inspire authentic worship. Romans 12.1 worship. What does Romans 12.1 say? It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's great mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, and let that be your spiritual, reasonable, intelligent act of worship. You see, singing and music is a powerful, important, beautiful expression of worship and helps us offer an invitation for deeper connection with each other and with God. But our lives surrendered in worship is what is required. So if you see room for improvement with your source material, especially the, the energy that comes from your congregation as they worship God through songs, please contact me through morethanmusicmentor.com. That's morethanmusicmentor.com. Send me an email. 
It'll come straight to my inbox and we can begin a conversation. Maybe you'd like to arrange your own online or on-site workshop, no matter where you are in the world. I'd love to speak to you about that and see if I can help. But as I bring this teaching video to a close, let me just give you a handful of tips that come from the More Than Music Mentor curriculum. Uh, and I'm going to start by painting a somewhat cynical, grossly overgeneralizing description of a typical Sunday morning church service, especially the music team that we call the worship team. Uh, forgive me if this is too cynical and generalizing for you, but I hope you get the point. You know, there's a young guy, he's called the worship leader. He's on the platform with a guitar over his shoulder and he's in front of his microphone. He's about to start the first song. Now, last Tuesday, when he rehearsed these songs at home on his own, he had a strong, deep sense of connection with God through these songs. His goal now on Sunday morning is that the congregation would have the same experience that he had. Beside him, there's a few singers. One of these singers, she's on the platform with this girl. She loves singing and she wants to sing. And the other girl, well, she highly values this personal individual connection she has with God when she's given this opportunity to be on the platform. She loves singing as an expression of worship to God and is looking forward to cultivating this transcendental experience that she identifies as worship. The drummer in the band, he just wants to play drums his way. The electric guitarist, he wants to try out his pedals so he knows what they sound like for his real band. The musical director bass player just wants the band to play these songs without any mistakes for once. The sound engineer, his goal is to make this mix sound as close to Spotify as possible. Now, the projectionist, they're there advancing lyric slides because they didn't know how to say no. There's people tugging in all different directions. But, but what if we all agreed? What if we all agreed that the worship of God is a full life response and that singing and gathering together, singing prayers to God is an important expression of worship. It's one of the ways we worship God. And the humanly measurable goal we want when we have these songs in our gatherings is that our, our whole congregation would sing together. We want to sing together, yes, as an expression of worship to God. Some of us may have deep connection with God through that moment, experiences of his manifest presence. But we want to see everyone in the room singing these songs and hear them singing these songs. Our humanly measurable goal is to get the congregation singing. Um, and here are some things that we can do to help that to happen. We need to have a shorter repertoire of songs. Because one of the main reasons why people in our congregation aren't singing is because they don't know half the songs that are being led. A lot of these songs are not singable. What if we reduce the number of songs to just those that are easily singable by Jack and Jill congregant? Most of the songs need to be really well known. We need to have fewer new songs. Uh, we need to be having songs used in our Sunday services with congregational participation as the main consideration rather than the preferences of someone in the band. We need to think about the key choice. Often these songs are presented and half the congregation can't sing them because they just can't reach the notes. We need to have a sound from the band that's cleaner and less cluttered, instrumentation that supports the voice of the congregation uh, rather than barraging them. The sound from the platform should be an embrace for the voice of the congregation. The congregation should be able to hear uh, a metaphorical gap in the sound that's just the right size for their voice. They don't need to be hit by a tsunami of sound. You know, our teams from the platform need to stop sending mixed messages. If we ask a congregation to stand and project lyrics, but then we start a song that they don't know, and it's in a key that they can't hit the notes, and if the leader is embellishing the melody and singing it their way, and if there's two or three other singers over there who are waiting for their harmony vocal in the, in the second chorus, we are sending mixed messages. We are saying sing with us, but actually don't. But what if we did this? What if we just sent the clear invitation to our congregation? We want you to participate, not spectate. This is not entertainment. This is an invitation. See, these changes I found over my years of doing more than music mentor can make a massive, 
positive difference to the source material. It'll not only improve the quality of your life dream, but it'll also improve the experience uh, for your congregation. And I think it'll have a positive impact on the life of your church. Hey, I hope to hear from you soon. Let's start that conversation. Thank you for watching.